So hi, uh, today we will be talking about how to license and promote your artwork, although uh, you can also uh, apply a lot of this knowledge to other forms of media. Uh, my name is Anastasia Owen. I am the Instructional Support Fellow for the CDBL, and I'm joined today here by Casey Long, who I will let introduce herself. Hi, I'm Casey Long. I am the Head of Research and Instruction in the Library, and I do a lot with copyright. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about specifically how copyright works, how to license your work, and then also how to promote your work. And I'll let Casey take it away. Cool. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is how to copyright your work. Um, and good news is copyright is automatic. So honestly, um, what you need to know as an artist is that you already retain this copyright. Um, and what that copyright means is that when it, we say you own the copyright, it means that you get to be the only one who reproduces it. So if you are a photographer and you wanna make multiple copies of the same image and distribute them at an art festival, you have that right. Or if you want to tell somebody else that they are allowed to take these multiple copies and sell them, then you have the right to give that um, ability to them. So you are the one who is able to reproduce. You are also the have the right to distribute. So that idea of telling somebody else that they can distribute it, uh, that's your sole right. Nobody can just take your image and distribute it in the way that they feel is um, the way that they want to do it unless they've gotten permission from you. Um, so that means even posting things onto the web uh, using images that you've created, they're not allowed to do that without your express permission. So automatically you would retain both of those rights as soon as you create the work. Derivatives, let's say that you just created the cutest image and you want to put it on t-shirts and on notebooks and you're gonna work with one of those company, printing companies to create all these products that could be sold. Those are called derivatives and derivatives are other ways that your work can be marketed. Um, and it could be also that you have a character. Let's say you have a character and there are ways to expand upon that character, then that's also a derivative. So something that falls within that family that belongs to that universe of characters, that's gonna belong to you as well. Um, and then finally, the ability to perform or display. So again, if um, an organization wants to put your work up and have it be something that is a focal point for a public event, then they need your permission to do that. The same is true if your work is gonna appear in some sort of video um, and is considered a focal point, then you have to give them the permission. So that's something that it's given to you automatically. And then you're probably wondering, well, why, why do we even have that copyright office? Why would I even need to go ahead and register with them? Well, um, Though your work is automatically protected, not everybody realizes that. It's something that many people just think, oh, it's published on the web, therefore it's free to use. Um, most companies would know not to do that, but you know, there's smaller businesses. Um, there's a lot of reasons why somebody might use your work in a way that you don't want it to be used. And so an extra way that you can um, put some heft into your copyright is to register it with the copyright office. It only costs about $45 uh, to $65 to register your copyright. And that might be a lot if you're doing a lot of different work. So that might be something that you wanna look into. I'm gonna go ahead and put that link into chat real quick so that you can take a look at that if you're interested. So that's one of the things that you can do is you can register the copyright. What the benefit of that versus not registering your copyright is that when somebody uses works that you own in a way that you don't like, um, it provides documentation that you are the one who created it. So let's go back to the idea that you created a character. Um, maybe somebody creates a similar character and wears the same outfit even, and there's just little differences. If you already registered that with the copyright office, they know for certain that you were the one who took it so seriously <laughs> to get um, your work out there. Um, and you have a date stamp essentially that will say that this belongs to you. In lieu of that, you should also consider signing, dating and documenting your work. So maybe you don't wanna go the copyright office route. 
sign and date and document your work. So maybe take a picture of your process um, of you creating it, take a picture of the finished work, have that be timestamped, keep good files. That way, again, if somebody uses your work without your permission and you want to address that, you will have the documentation showing that, no, no, I had that logo before you did <laughs> and uh, you took it from me. So we've all heard those kind of stories. Uh, then next, maybe you are comfortable with people using your work. Remember, people don't remember that work is copyrighted. And you're probably uh, an artist who has wondered about somebody's work, whether you could actually reuse that work. Um, because, you know, maybe you don't feel like it bothers you for somebody to borrow your work. In fact, you feel honored. They should feel honored too, right? Well, um, it's best to just create that level of communication with your viewers by just putting a Creative Commons license on your work to tell them you are comfortable with them using it in a specific way. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, so that's another option you have for protecting your work is to place a Creative Commons license on that. And then finally, one of the things that they highly recommend is don't post your high quality images to the net. Um, always make sure that there's like a watermark or something, maybe their thumbnail size only, uh, something where it will degrade the image if somebody tries to replicate it um, in its full form. So those are a few ways that you can protect yourself. Now, um, any questions? All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how to license your work. And this is purely just talking about the Creative Commons licensing. So um, there are several different licenses that you can do through Creative Commons. Again, remember, this is just a way you can communicate with your viewers about how they can reuse your work. If you don't want anybody to be reusing your work and you want to have that clear communication, go ahead and put an all rights reserved license on your work. That way people will know that they have to ask you for permission to reuse it. Um, you might be comfortable giving them the right to reuse it at that point, but it starts the conversation off the right way and makes your intentions clear. But with Creative Commons, let's go ahead and put that link into the chat so that you can take a look at that yourself. So Creative Commons gives us the ability to narrow how things are gonna be used. So maybe you don't really want people who are using your work for commercial purposes to use it. You can place a non-commercial license that's in C and it means that only people who are um, using your work for a nonprofit, non-commercial organization or just personal use may reuse it. And that could be even for um, a charity event or something like that. Um, there's also a share alike. You're being such a nice person, letting your work be reused. Maybe you only want to let other people reuse your work if they're willing to do the same. So it's kind of like that pass it forward um, kind of philosophy. And then um, no derivatives. That's another option that they can copy it, but you don't want them to make changes to it because you know there's a lot of ways that one could change your work and you can be very clear that it's okay to reuse it in any of these other circumstances, but please don't change it. Just use it in its original form. And then finally, the easiest and um, most broad is just attribution, that you are able to put your work out there and um, that they in return just give you attribution, say that where they got the, the work from um, and give you credit. So that'll build up your business. They do also have in Creative Commons um, a license where you can put it into public domain, but by putting it in public domain, you give up all your rights. So it's usually better just to go ahead and say with attribution um, and leave it at that if you want to do a kind of a broad copyright um, Creative Commons license. All right. So that's what I had. And now um, I believe that Anastasia is going to tell you about how to promote your work. Yeah, so uh, promoting your work tends to be a complex sort of intimidating thing to talk about it uh, when talking about it in a digital sense. Uh, next slide, please. But generally, the first thing to consider is where you want to push your audience to. So whether that be digital portfolio, social media, Flickr, or anything like that, 
you need to have a constant stream to one singular place. And you can have multiple other places where you have your artwork listed. Um, but it's always good to think about what types of features do you want to give your audience? What do you want your audience to pay attention to? So I just put together a little compare and contrast um, thing about using a digital portfolio, because as you know, Agnes.college provides digital portfolios for students um, versus using a social media platform. So the benefit of using digital portfolio, you can update in batches. It's a lot more catering to um, more stagnant information with social media. You need to constantly be updating it. It needs to have a constant flow of information coming into your audience. You have more control and room for authority on digital portfolio, less so for social media. Again, speaking to the fact that it is more stagnant on your digital portfolio, you can curate things a little bit easier when it comes to content on a digital portfolio. Uh, social media only really allows you to do that visually. So if you if you ever seen those like uh, those color gradients that people like to do for their profiles, that's great. But again, it's mixed in with everyone else that you follow. So you're trying to get more visually eye grabbing things. There's a lot more pressure to that. Um, digital portfolios lends itself to longer meaningful interactions, aka point people to an email address they can talk to you on or if they comment, if you're allowing comments on things that you post versus social media is very quick. Um, so this can also mean that you're doing a lot more things in terms of like a like a frequently asked questions would be a common thing to include on your social media because you're going to get asked similar questions a lot and you're going to be expected to answer them quickly and accurately a lot. Um, as I mentioned before, digital portfolios easier to categorize and organize your bigger, chunkier content. Social media, it's, it's very beneficial for visual curation. And then, as I mentioned, digital portfolio has more static content, social media has more constantly moving content. So there's pros and cons to both. Um, I mean, of course, I'm from the Center for Digital and Visual Literacy, so I always suggest digital portfolio. It really just depends on what do you think is the type of information you're trying to give about your media, right? Next slide, please. So let's talk more about curation because that's where you should start. What story slash theme are you playing with? And I say playing with instead of necessarily telling because sometimes you don't necessarily have a full story. I know when I'm creating my art, I'm very much going in, I like this color and I like this line and therefore I'm gonna make it. And that's what that is. <laughs> so just think about what sort of categories are you thinking in? Do you have a specific art style? Do you dabble in a lot of different things? How can you categorize your work with that story slash theme, right? Are you thinking more of a gallery versus post scenario? Posts would speak probably more to um, a digital portfolio, a post meaning something that you're attaching a lot of text to, and then galleries might speak a little bit more towards social media, but again, you can have both on, on your digital portfolio. I put um, an example on the right hand side, this is an example of a CDVL tutors website, Adina Adams, very wonderful website. If you're an artist, I do recommend going out to check out her website and her artwork. You see she has buttons there that say all digital art, illustrations, ink, paintings, personal work, etc. That's how she's categorized her art by medium by by the form that they take. And that's very effective. And then this is her front page. So she has a list of maybe I think 12 uh, selected works essentially where she has said if you click on these you get a blown up image you get more of the story you get more of what this is about my personal favorite that she's done is um in the oh, what is that movie called oh no spider-man into the spider-verse she did a little ink drawing of that it was great it has sunflowers in it it's very cute um speaking more to what casey said about if you're trying to make sure nobody's like, quote unquote, stealing your work when you're uploading things, keep track of your sizing. You always want to make sure your sizing is consistent. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have the exact same sizing for everything, but generically try to keep it within the same family, maybe consistently upload lower quality images, maybe consistently try to make sure your watermark is the same size. Uh, keep track of your file types. .pngs are high quality. .jpegs are lower quality. 
focus on quality then quantity what that means is you want as i said for adina's website she has a selected work page these are her 12 things on the front page that are really really great she thinks is really really strong then you click on the categories then you get everything that she's made within that category this can also apply to social media think about what you're posting at the beginning of the week versus towards the end of the week think about the first image that you're posting uh, if you're doing one of those like where you can select one through 10 images that you have to swipe through, think about what your first image is. Focus on quali quality, then quantity. And then don't be afraid to tell your story. A lot of people feel like they have to have this gorgeous Emily Dickinson-esque uh, three paragraph long version of why you painted that thing. You don't have to have that. People honestly just want to know what's in your head. And if what's in your head was, I like the color yellow, they want to know that. Um, next slide, please. So keeping with the idea of consistency, consistency is the name of the game or one of the names of the games. Um, you wanna keep the same verbiage slash attribution. This is another example of a CDBL tutor. Her name is Lisette. Notice that she does her attributions or captions more accurately the exact same way. She says credit, colon, the title of the thing, who took it, and then the license, and then she has hyperlinked every single one of those. That lets me know that every single image on her site, I'm going to be able to know a little bit more context of it, right? Look up common nomenclature if you don't know how you want to license things. This is just one way to display it. I feel like it's a very common way to put this type of caption, but it's very, very effective, right? Because it tells me who created it, when, why, and how. Um, and then again, hyperlinking, if you're on the internet, hyperlinks are always gonna be your best friend. Try to make sure that is all very accurate. And notice she also is putting them in a similar space, like either right above or right below, rather than having to go like click on it to find it and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So communicating with your audience. This is something that I think has become more relevant in the past couple of years. But there's a ton of different ways to do this. This is just one example. As I mentioned, social media, if you're using that as your main space, is going to be expecting you to constantly have your button and your phone right next to you to talk to people. If you don't, it can feel like you're some alien conglomerate that doesn't really care about your audience interaction with your thing. We can effectively make people assume that you don't want them to interact with your thing, right? So you always want to try to answer questions promptly and succinctly. Assume nothing. This is a key thing that if you've worked in any kind of, um, what is it called? Oh, no. Where you've worked customer service. There we go. Where if you've worked in any sort of customer service job, you probably know what I mean when I say assume nothing. Never assume that they see the answer right in front of them. Never assume that they don't want the whole story, you know what I mean? Give more than what you expected uh, to give and then make it easy to contact you. For social media, that's pretty easy. They can just hit you up with a DM. For digital portfolios, you wanna make sure that your contact email or contact information in some way is clearly labeled somewhere, right? Um, I use an example from Blimes and Gab, if you know them, they're one of my favorite hip hop duos. They had a, New song come out, I believe it's called Baptism. They posted their music video on social media. It was pre or on YouTube, excuse me, which is social media. Um, and it was really cool. They had a really great reaction to it. They decided that rather than just say, and I quote from Leslie, whoever, I want to be born again just because blah, 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 and then quote that in their posting of it. They did a great thing when it comes to authorship and interaction, and they screenshotted the comment underneath the video on YouTube, which visually tells me as an audience member, this thing is on YouTube, they pay attention to the comments, and also gives like a shout out and gives me some sort of pretty visual because that's a gorgeous skyline. Um, and it also gives authorship all in one file swoop. This is a great way to sort of skirt around the fact that a lot of social media doesn't allow for hyperlinks in that way. So because they're limited by the fact that I don't know if you see in there that it says go watch our video on YouTube rather than just hyperlinking to the video. It's a bit of a bummer, but this is a way that they got around that and it's a beautiful way to show that they pay attention to what people are asking. Next slide please. 
So I always mention accessibility because people tend to throw this to the wayside and I do not know why. Accessibility is the name of the game. I know I said that was for consistency, but this is truly the name of the game because people pay attention to that sort of thing. It can be very jarring if you're not paying attention to colors and to font. If things are hard to read, even if they're easy to read to you and you're like, this font is cool, it may make it completely illegible to the person next to you, right? So this is uh, another artist I love, Hate Copy, um, hatecopy.com, if you want to go check her out. Also on social media, I believe it's just Hate Copy. She does a great job. A lot of her art is bold colors. Uh, has text involved in it. Um, she's a pop artist, so she uses a lot of neon-esque colors, and it can be overwhelming. Also, a lot of her artwork is very, very big. Think of like the size of a hood of a car, right? So when she posts on her website that you can go buy these images, first of all, notice that the format that she's saying that you can go buy these images, she's not just posting the image. She's doing a really clever thing. Like um, this is the equivalent of trying to do a watermark. She has little images of binder clips clipping onto that image, which is gorgeous because it means if anybody wanted to screenshot it, they would have to screenshot around these little binder clips, right? First of all. Second of all, her entire website, 90% of it is white background, dark font on white background. And she's using sans serif font, which is generically considered to be visually accessible. Um, so she's not bombarding you with a lot of text either. She's giving you bullet point information. What size is it? What is the title? The title of it is the exact same as the text that is in it, right? She's making it very clear to understand what's going on here, right? So this is a great example of somebody taking accessibility in mind. She also has alt text, which is the text if you hover on an image, it shows you a little alternative text that comes up there. That's perfect for anybody that's using a screen reader for images. So highly recommend doing that. Next slide, please. And then finally, I just wanted to cover some other things to consider. Um, the three images you see here, uh, I'm gonna jump down to the last slide, or not last slide, last point, mm -hmm. building a color palette. Um, this website is great if you want to build a color palette, but also the artist, the creator, excuse me, of this website is really, really smart. His name is Fabrizio Binacci. He has everything pointed to the actual website, the coolers.co website, uh, which Casey will put the link in the chat for you guys to check out if you want to. So if you go to the website, it's that bottom left image where it says, howdy. And it has links to his website and his social media. If you go to his website, it links to coolers.co and his social media. If you go to social media, it links to coolers.co. It's a very smart system. It's very simple. He does not have a ton of tabs. He posts graphics all the time about it, which effectively is telling the story, letting him know where to go to find the thing, and then letting people know how to contact him very, very effectively. Um, and I'm going to hand it back to Casey to do the wrap up. Cool. So we only have two more things that we wanted to share with you. Um, you might have been interested in knowing what are some places that you can put your work. So you have it on your portfolio, you have it on your social media. Here are some options that you have for getting paid. So first off, there's the print on demand sites. Those are things like Society6, Redbubble, Zazzle, things like that. You're gonna get either a commission from them or you're gonna get, um, you can set a certain fee with some of these sites. They're all a little bit different. And we will share these slides with you afterwards so you can um, get these links so you can look at the site reviews. So that's print on demand sites. It means that you're kind of working for them. Um, and they're getting a part of your work. And sometimes the commissions might be low. Um, so you really gotta decide, is that the way that you wanna put your work out there? The next is to do print on demand companies. Sites, companies, what's the difference? Um, a company is one that is gonna work with you to get you your product so that you can redistribute it. So that could be that you have on your portfolio a little store and you have mugs and all sorts of consumer products that you want to have your design be on and you're gonna have sent to the consumers. So some of these companies will do the legwork for you. They um, will ship the items to your customers or other companies will just send to you in bulk. 
the items and then you can do the shipping yourself or take them to an art fair or something that you want to do. So those are two different options that you have for getting paid. Another is um, we all know about Etsy. So there's these art artist marketplaces. It's places where you can have an online shop. So it's great that you have your portfolio um, or your website, but you also might wanna get more visibility by being in these artist marketplaces. And so usually you have a membership and there's a fee um, and they can differ in terms of whether you get a commission of the work or if there's just a straight fee that you're paying um, for owning that space in their marketplace. So there's several listed here for that. Um, if you are a photographer, then you might consider trying to submit your work to a stock photography agency. Those again work off a commission or they will ask, to, they will pay you for your individual work and you'll be signing over some of your copyright for them to be able to distribute the works. So you'll want to pay attention to those con contracts. Um, some of the big names are listed here. And then finally, freelance. Um, if you've been, if you got your site set up and you've got your um, portfolio, what you need to do is get your name in those directories. So these are some sites where you could go put your name and um, people who are looking for freelance artists will be able to come find you based off of the type of work that you do. And that's another way you can point yourself out to your uh, website. So those are some ways that you can get paid. Now, if all you really are interested in right now is just being findable and getting recognized, having your work be recognized and commented on, then there's some other options that you have as well. You can join an artist community like Flickr or um, DeviantArt, ArtStation, using social media. You can put yourself out there and there'll be communities on these sites that might be for your specific type of art and people can engage with it, put comments. Um, and you can also decide whether you wanna do a Creative Commons license there or restrict the reuse of your work. It's just a place where you could share and put yourself visually out there. If you don't wanna create a full portfolio, this is another option for you. Um, the Creative Commons, if you're going to be putting a Creative Commons license on your work, you might as well get into those Creative Commons port, uh, repositories. And some good ones that are out there are Flickr. Um, not all items in Flickr are Creative Commons, but um, the Creative Commons search tools will pick up your Creative Commons license from Flickr. Um, same with YouTube, Sketchfab, uh, Venmo, uh, Wikimedia Commons. I love that one as a place to upload your images, especially if you've done any travel someplace and you have factual things that are like people, places, monuments, things like that. Um, so that is a good place to go ahead and put your images so that when somebody's searching Google images and they narrow it down to the uh, images that are licensed with Creative Commons, your work will be found and they might reuse it. And if you've got that um, attribution license on there, they have to tell people who you are. So that's another great way to get started. Finally, we all love Unsplash and Pixabay and these free image sites where no attribution is required. You can um, sign up to upload a gallery of your own work there too. You'll have to be approved. So there's, there's a little bit of cachet of, oh, I've been accepted. My work is good enough to appear on these sites and it's been reviewed. That might be another option that you wanna do. And you don't have to put all your work up there. You can just put a few things, but your name again gets out there and people will be able to find you. So those were some of the things that we wanted to share with you and we're a little bit over. So just checking real quick to see if there's any questions. All right. Well, Anastasia, do you have anything else that you want to share? Uh, not really, other than reach out to us if you have any more questions about this type of thing. Um, and thank you guys for attending. Great. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. I'm so sorry. I was trying to type out my question.